Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, while he opened to us the scripture? Now, the common English Bible puts it like this. Weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scripture to us? And then the World Translation Bible says it like this. Weren't we excited when he talked with us on the road and opened up the meaning of the scriptures for us? Checking the temperature of our hearts. I begin this message with this question. I think I already know the answer to it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Has anybody under the sound of my voice ever experienced a season or even just a moment of disappointment? Disappointment. Disappointment. I never myself, nor have I seen or heard, Sister Linda, anybody say, I'm so disappointed, with a big smile on their face. <laughs> it just doesn't go together. I'm disappointed, and I'm so glad about it. <laughs> now, anyone that does that, Reverend Howard, I would tend to think that like I was on an airplane some years ago and it seemed like the airplane was going to crash. Anybody ever been on one of them planes that's just going all over the place? And there are people doing their Hail Marys. There are people saying, praise the Lord. There are people saying, Lord, help. Don't let this plane crash. But there was one fella seated right across the aisle from me. He was just laughing hilariously. And I said to myself, I'm more afraid of him than I am the plane crashing. Because I knew something had to be wrong with him. Now somebody said, well, that's just his way of dealing with things. Well, it might have been, but he sure seemed like he was happy to me. <laughs> so it is that way with disappointment, not just fear. Disappointment is something we all have to go through, but it's nothing we really enjoy. Can I get a witness? Now, the dictionary definition of disappointment is, quote, to fail to fulfill expectations, hopes, or plans, end of quote. So right there, the first word used, to fail, again, failure comes to all of us. Young people, don't think you're going to go through life and not have some failures, not have some defeats. But the old folk down where I used to live, they used to say, just because you fall doesn't mean you have to wallow. And what they were saying is we may fall down, but just as sure as we fall down, God will give us the strength to get back up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You were down. You had to admit to yourself, I failed. I've been defeated. I'm downcast, but I'm not going to stay like this. And the God I serve has put his spirit within us, we say, that just like I was knocked down, I'm going to get back up. What do they say about great heavyweight fighters or great fighters, period? It's not just a fighter who knows how to deliver a punch, but the great fighter also knows how to take a punch. Somebody said one man, he was a great deliverer of punches, but he had a glass jaw. And you didn't even have to hit him hard, just give him a jab. Pow! Down he goes. But the great fighter, you all wrote, well, some of y'all won't. I'm showing my age now. There was once a great fighter, his name was Muhammad Ali. You may have heard of him. Muhammad Ali, formerly Cassius Clay, Cassius Marcellus Clay, out of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Well, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, he was just mowing people down, mowing people down, mowing people down, mowing people down. And you all know the problem he had with the United States government. After a while, they said, oh, I leave the greatest person in the world. And they had him carrying the torch for the Olympics. But it wasn't always like that. At one time, he was the most hated man in America. But he stood up for his right. I remember being so proud, even as a young man, he said, ain't no Viet Cong ever called me nigger.
So Muhammad Ali, after he went through everything he went through, he fought a man named Smoking Joe Frazier. And Joe Frazier was something else. And I remember that great fight in, uh, in uh, uh, New York City. And have you ever pulled for an athlete so hard, maybe a boxer, that every time they get hit, you said, ouch. <laughs> and that's the way I felt about Ali. Uh, when I watched him fight, when he would get hit, I'd say, ouch. Because great, that was the great love I had in not wanting him to lose because there were so many folk who wanted him to lose. When he fought Sonny Lister, they said Sonny Lister was going to kill him. And Sonny Lister said himself, I'm going to kill him. But oh, that was another plan. So when he fought Joe Frazier, I think it was around the 15th or 14th round late in the fight, Joe Frazier hit him with a Joe Frazier left hook. And down went Ali. But Ali didn't stay down. And some of the historians of the fight game, the fight business said that that was a defining moment in the greatness of Muhammad Ali, that he has shown he knew how to throw a punch. He has shown he knew how to box and get out of certain situations while he was on his feet. But when he went down, they said a whole lot of boxers would have stayed down. But when you know how to give a punch, good. But when you know how to take a punch, hello somebody, even better. And you're going to be disappointed in life. You're going to have failures in life. But if not your victories that define you, it is the defeats you have and the failures you have to go through that when you get knocked down, get back up. Get back in the fight. And don't let nobody tell you just because you fall, you got to wallow. Hello, somebody. There are two kinds of disappointment, maybe more, but I will just lift up two. One is when we are mildly disappointed. Anybody ever been mildly disappointed? But there's another disappointment that is tremendous disappointment. You don't share tears over mild disappointment, but you might shed a few over tremendous disappointment. Anybody ever been disappointed by a relative? Anybody been tremendously disappointed by a friend? Anybody been tremendously disappointed by a spouse? Anybody been tremendously disappointed so that it seems like, in the words of that song, my whole world ended because of the, the pain of disappointment. These men in our text, I believe, and you will agree with me, I believe, that they were not walking the road to Emmaus mildly disappointed. They were walking that road tremendously disappointed by what had recently transpired in their lives. And not only their lives, but in the lives of so many others. <clears throat> An event had taken place which had robbed them of their hope, crushed their spirit, and in the words of that phrase, taken all the wind out of their sails. The event was what? The arrest, the crucifixion, and the burial of Jesus of Nazareth. These men were in the process of making the four-mile journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They were crestfallen. They were downcast. They were despondent. They were disheartened. They were disconsolate. They were melancholy, gloomy, and sad. Verse 14 tells us they discussed all the things that had happened. Now, what had happened? Jesus had been crucified. And as they walked the road of gloom from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a stranger joined them on the way. That's why I said I want y'all to read that now. Because God going to give you something. When you read it, he may not have given me as I read it so many times. But they entered into a discussion with the man that they didn't know who he was. Now, that says a lot right there because 
there are some folk that I have known that if they were engaged in a conversation with another person and somebody else came to butt in, they would look at them and say, this is an A and B conversation and you'll see. <laughs> butt out. I think I told you about an instance in my past ministry where a gentleman that I had invited to church several times, he owned a business just right across the street from the church. And I would go over to him and I would just go sometimes and didn't even need uh, 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 anything repaired, didn't need a shoe shine. And I just go so that I could invite him to church. And so finally, I guess he got sick of me. He said, Pastor Patterson, I'm never coming to your church. I'm like, what? Why? He said, because those are some mean folk over there at that church. I said, well, everybody mean? He said, enough of them mean. I said, well, why don't you come? And I said, are you mean? He said, no, I'm not mean. I said, well, you come on. At least there'll be one person in the church that Sunday who's not mean. Well, he didn't take too kindly to that. <clears throat> he said, well, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Last Sunday, one of your members was coming out of the church. And I had left something over here to shop, and I picked it up, and I was going back to what I was doing that Sunday afternoon. And I said, hey, how you doing? And uh, they looked at me and said, do I know you? And he said, well, you do know me, but do you have to know me to speak to me? And so here these two men were engaged in a conversation. They already disgusted. And if anybody ever broke in on your conversation while you were disgusted, if you're in a good mood, maybe things would be all right. But these men were disgusted. They were crestfallen. Something terrible had happened in their lives. So give them credit for the fact that they engaged in a conversation with this third party who had just come upon them while they were walking. Well, the third party began to talk to them. And they, well, well, well you know, what y'all talking about? Well, where you been? What rock you been hiding out from under? You Rip Van Winkle been sleeping and just woke up? What you mean? What they, man, everybody know what just happened to Jesus of Nazareth. They went on to talk about what happened to Jesus of Nazareth. The stranger listened to him, and finally he lit into him. It's interesting that the Bible tells us don't call folk fools. But if you read that, and I know y'all are going to read it, amen, hello, I trust y'all. You're going to find that Jesus called them foolish and questioned why was it that they had not understood better what had been said before Jesus left that they might understand what was going on now. So as they talked and they talked and they talked and they talked, then they said, look, man, we were kind of perturbed with you when you first broke into our conversation but seem to be you all right. You know the Bible. You know the scripture. And you telling us things that I guess we should have already known, but we don't. Why don't you hang around? Why don't we catch a bite to eat? Why don't we, there ain't no McDonald's, but we'll come up with something. And the Bible tells us that they sat and they supped with the stranger. And as they supped with the stranger, they found out who the stranger was. Hello, somebody. They found out that they hadn't just been talking to anybody along that road. That was the reason that man knew so much about the scripture. Because he was talking about the fulfillment of the scripture concerning himself. And so there they were. And when they saw who he was, here comes the part of the Bible that some folks think we are crazy for believing. Some of the things that are in the Bible. The Bible tells us that as soon as they recognize him, the man disappeared. Where he go? But they didn't stay there long. We come to the words of our text, and they said, what? Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us and opened up the scripture? Weren't our hearts on fire 
Weren't we excited about what we were hearing to the point where it replaced our gloom, it replaced our sorrow, it replaced our downheartedness, and we came up with a new lease on life because the man opened the scriptures to us as we walked along the road. Friend of mine started with me and ending with you and ending with you and starting with me. It is important that we not go long periods of time without checking the temperature of our hearts. I'm going to say it again. It is so important that we not go long periods of time without checking the temperature of our hearts. We want to make sure that our hearts have not grown cold. We want to make sure that our hearts have not become merely lukewarm. We want to make sure that our hearts are not in such condition that there's a lack of zeal, lack of enthusiasm, lack of excitement, and lack of fire necessary to live and to minister out of the overflow of the Spirit in our lives. In the physical, we go for, hopefully, annual exam. Let me just say to somebody who's been neglecting your health, Take care of the temple. Take care of the temple. This body is the temple in which the Holy Spirit resides. And we ought not put all the wrong kind of food in the temple. Oh, y'all, look how y'all looking at me now. I know them pork chops taste good. That macaroni and cheese, oh, it's the bomb. Them sweet potatoes, oh, my Lord, did you have your mouth just running? And oh, it's finger licking good. Oh, Colonel, come here, Colonel. I can't wait to get to you, Colonel. But I watch some of the commercials on television for food. See these big old hamburgers. So enticing. I said, there is a heart attack waiting to happen. <laughs> Take care, somebody, yeah. of the temple. Right. And then we won't, I'm not saying, you know, don't call me when you get sick, but I surely believe that there were a lot of people who wouldn't end up in certain situations with certain diseases if they were just taking care of themselves. Yeah. Some folks smoke like a chimney. Then up the road, they develop lung cancer. And they want every preacher to stop what they're doing, come lay hands on them, and pray for their healing. I'd like to say, but can't. I sure wish you had called me before you start puffing or in the midst of your puffing 20 years ago so that you wouldn't be in this condition. And I know you can get lung cancer and never touch a cigarette. But y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who don't have any care for their body. We need to teach these young folk how to eat to live. One of the biggest messes I got myself into in a church years ago in Washington, D.C., we were having a program for the youth, and they had the menu. They said, Pastor, we want you to Approved the menu. I said, okay. Eggs, bacon, ham, hash browns, biscuits, syrup. I said, beloved, if we want to kill ourselves, that's one thing. But let's not kill the children. <laughs> what are you wrong about? I said, no, I'm not going to approve this menu. What you talking about? I said, let's teach them how to eat to live. Let's get some fruit. Let's give them a better way. Let's show them. If they're not going to learn it in the church, where are they going to learn it? Do you know those people called the bishop the next day and told them to come get this food out of this church and send us a pastor who has good sense? And so our 
Young People's Department, as we have programs, let's, you know, supplement what I'm sure they're getting at home, but somebody at home trying to teach a young child how to eat properly, then they send them to church. Oh, look how y'all looking at me. <laughs> Good part is I don't care how you look at me. If it's the truth, it's the truth. I'm going to tell it, and I don't care where the chips fall. We need to, in addition to black history videos, in addition to teaching them about the Beatitudes and the Ten Commandments and the Gospels and the Epistle and the Prophets and the Revelation, we also need to teach them how to take care of their bodies so that they can be fit servants of the true and the living God. So here we are in this uh, situation where in the physical, we go for annual exams. Anybody ever heard that, those two words? Yeah. Annual exam. Now one of the things they check out during the physical exam is to see if our heart is in good condition. One of the first things they do is take the thesoscope I think I'm pronouncing it right. And they listen. Mmm. Mmm, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I told the doctor, I say, what that mm-hmm mean? But don't all of us want, when they check our heart, for the doctor to say, your heart is in good condition. But if the heart is not in good condition, does the doctor say, well, your heart is in a bad fix, but that's all right. Just go on home, and I'll see you this time next year. Now, if you got a doctor like that, you need to walk out of the office, but you don't never need to come back. And you need to go out of that office saying, you better not go to this one here because he just told me my heart was all messed up, that it was all right to go home and come back in a year. No, what happens then is that if the heart is not what it should be, the doctor devises a plan so that the heart can be restored to where it will be such that we can have a healthy body. I wish I had a witness today. That's in the physical. We want to know that the heart is not pumping too fast, that the heart is not pumping too slow. Sometimes they say your heart is pumping at 30% capacity. Well, that, what about the other 70%? Well, that's what we need to work on. And if we are wise, now I know some people, they go to the doctor, and uh, what did the doctor say? Well, the doctor said so-and-so. Oh, okay, that's what you're going to do. No, I ain't thinking about that. <laughs> and I always say, why go to the doctor? I'm helping somebody right through here if you're listening. Why go to the doctor if you're not going to listen to what the doctor says? That's why we have doctors, to follow the directions, follow the instructions, so that we can be healthy human beings. Well, it's the same way in the spiritual realm. We need to check our hearts on a regular basis to make sure our hearts are functioning properly. In the Bible, the heart represents the seat of the desires, affections, and motives of a person and signifies all the faculties and powers of an intellectual, moral, and accountable human being. That's the heart. This is why we must make sure that our hearts have the right temperature. And the right temperature is that our hearts be like these men in this text. Did not our hearts burn within us? Were not our hearts on fire? What about us, church? Do we have burning hearts on fire and filled with excitement and enthusiasm and zeal for things of God. Some people, and you may know some of them, they won't grunt in church. If somebody says amen too loud, they're looking at them funny. If they lift up a hand and praising God, don't take all that. But you put that same person in a baseball stadium. 
Let them go to the football game. If they like soccer, let them go to a soccer match. And sometimes they don't even have to go to the game. You ever been with somebody who's on fire for their team watching the game on television? But that same person either won't come to church or when they come to church won't even grunt while the choir's singing, while the preacher's preaching, while the saints are rejoicing. So the question is, do we have hearts on fire for the Lord? I said, do we have hearts on fire for the Lord? And these young people need to be taught that it's all right to pull for your favorite team. But there's a team that we all need to be a part of, and that's the Jesus team. That's the winning team. That's the team that's going to get us over. That's the team that's going to secure our eternal destiny. That's the team that's going to have us one day lifted up high and mighty in his presence. All day long we praise his holy name. Friend of mine, I'm coming to, I'm coming to my conclusion now. And that is these men on this road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They had lost their devotion. They had lost their passion. They had lost their fervor. They had lost their fire. They were disheartened by the thought that they had trusted Jesus. They had placed their hopes in Jesus. They said, read it. I trusted y'all now. Read it when you get home. They had placed their trust in Jesus and now Jesus is nowhere to be found. Dead and buried. So there they walk in their gloom. But here to me, says to go is the jumping up shout news. That as despondent as they were, as downcast as they were, as hung down as their heads were, they still love Jesus. Oh, I wish I had a witness in here today. Sometimes it's not going to be a sunshine today. Sometimes there are going to be clouds overhead. Sometimes there are going to be fierce winds of opposition in our face. Sometimes we're not going to have that bubbly personality. We're going to have a day when our head is hung down. But oh, if we can still hold on to our love for Jesus, if we can just know that if we hold on to his unchanging hand, that everything is going to be all right. They had not lost everything. They still loved Jesus. That's why they were talking about him along the way. If they, had, if they didn't love Jesus, he'd have just been a thing of the past. Hello, somebody. But they loved him, and they were trying to figure out what in the world happened. Why had this awful thing happened to our Lord? And I'm going to tell you, church, sometimes we get like that. The love we have for the Lord, yes. But there are circumstances and situations that come into our lives that knock the wind out of us. Oh, I wish I had a witness. Sometimes it sends us into a tailspin. Sometimes our lives are turned upside down and then downside up. We become discouraged and wonder whether things will ever be like we thought they would be as we face the winds of life that thwart our free movement and frustrate even our godly desires. And a Christian people are not careful and prayerful. Prayerful and careful. They will find themselves, watch out somebody, merely going through the motions. Barely able to make it to church. Singing songs, delivering messages, developing programs, trying to say all the right things. Trying to do all the right things. But something is missing. The fire has gone out. They no longer have <laughs> hearts burning and on fire for the Lord. Pessimism sets in. Dejection sets in. The out 
outlook becomes gloomy. Their spirits are low. Their churches are dead. Something they once had, they don't have anymore. But if they would have a checkup, to see what is the temperature of their heart. They would see what the problem is and develop a plan of fire restoration. And it would start with what happened to these men in this text. First of all, and you're going to see it when you read it at home because I trust y'all, that they finally recognized the presence of the Lord on that road with them. Oh, y'all didn't hear what I just said. They recognized the presence of the Lord on that road with them. In the midst of that gloom, disappointment, and despair, there was Jesus right there walking beside them, opening up the scriptures and their understanding. Hello, somebody. And when it was only when they recognized Jesus that the script was flipped. And they were able to emerge from their despair. They went from one extreme to another after their encounter with the Lord. So somebody today, I want you to recognize that whatever you are going through, I said whatever you are going through, I said whatever you are going through, the Lord is right there with you. I said the Lord is right there. I don't care what it is. The devil is busy, God. The devil is busy, God is busier. The devil is powerful, the Lord is all powerful. The Lord has his imps, God has his angels. Whatever it is that we need, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we may ask or think according to the power of faith that worketh within us. All we have to do to emerge from the darkness of gloom and walk into the light of our future with a heart burning full of excitement and determined to live the life the Lord wants, desires, and wills that we live. A burning heart will produce light and light will cast away the darkness of disappointment and despair. So let us make sure to keep checking the temperature of our hearts. Keep checking the temperature of our hearts. Don't let too many days go by and you don't check the temperature of your heart. You need to get down on your knees. The devil said, what you getting down on your knees for? Tell him you ain't welcome in this conversation. This is between me and my God. I'm on my knees because I'm doing a spiritual checkup. I want to make sure that my heart has the right temperature, that I don't let the fire go out. That's the problem as I close with so many. The fire has gone out. And if we are not careful, we will walk around with hearts, but they won't be burning hearts. They won't be hearts on fire. They won't be hearts excited for the things of God. Where are you going? I'm going to church. Why are you going to church? Because God's been good to me. And I'm going, I, I, I praise him Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, but it's just something about getting together with the saints on Sunday. And I could walk in there, and I could say to myself, I, I was glad when they said unto me, come and let's go into the house of the Lord. Somebody said, come and go with me to my father's house. Come on, somebody, come go with me to my father's house. And that's what we need to do is be on fire for the Lord. Not let our fire go out. Because somebody needs our fire. Somebody said, if you don't have fire yourself, you can't give warmth to nobody else. If somebody around you in your community, somebody around you even in the church, they need to feel the fire that's burning in your soul. Somebody said from the Old Testament, it's like fire, shut up in my bones. Anybody here today who knows about that fire burning in your heart? Well, in the scripture here, you will read it because I trust y'all, that after they had acknowledged the fact that they had burning hearts, they got up and did something. So you can't have a burning heart and hold on to a stool to do nothingness. You can't have a burning heart and too many days, weeks, months, and years go by 
and you haven't done anything for the Lord. See, a burning heart produces activity. That activity means that I'm going to do my best to let the Lord's light shine so somebody can see it. That's why the Bible said, let your light so shine that others may see your good works. Somebody said, well, I don't want nobody to see my good works. I just, that's just between me and the Lord. But let me tell you something. When there's fire shut up in your bones and fire shut up in my bones, we're going to take activity. We're going to take action that somebody is going to be able to say, there goes a child of God, not ashamed of the Lord. There goes a child of God who knows the word. There goes a child of God who's lifting the name of the Lord higher and higher. There goes a child of God who may have been through something, may still be going through something. But there goes a child of God that hadn't let the devil put their fire out, hadn't let the devil walk and have them walking around with a hung down head continuously. Yes, we may have a hung down head, but when we understand the scripture, when he opens it up to us, then we look up and smile. Devil, you thought you had me. Devil, you thought I'd go quit. Devil, you thought I would go take a punch and stay down. But here I am, back for more. Here I am, still in the spirit. Here I am, determined to be what God wants me to be. Here I am. Don't let the devil pick your fire. This jar, I said this jar. I said, this joy, not another joy, this joy that we have. The world didn't give it. And it is jumping up shouting news that uh, the devil, the world, can not take it away. Yeah. Father God, in Jesus' name, I have shared with your people that which you have laid upon my heart. As I check my spiritual temperature, check the heart that is within me to make sure I hadn't let trials and tribulations, frustrations, frustrations and disappointments put out my fire, steal my joy, and take away the excitement that your children should have as we labor in the vineyard. And so, Lord, you have given me this message once it permeated my spirit, served as a reminder, check the temperature of your heart. Now I brought it to your people. And let somebody today who heard this message, whether here at Allen Chapel or on the internet, stop. Look and listen. And check the temperature of their hearts. And if their hearts are wax cold, if they're just lukewarm in your service, not giving you the proper praise, not the service that you call upon your people to render, then, Lord, let them ask for forgiveness and develop a new determination to be able to say, as I commune with the Lord, does not my heart burn within me? And now I get up to let my light so shine. I pray this prayer into the spirit of every person in this room as we check the temperatures of our hearts and reflect the joy of the Lord that is our strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Let us stand across the sanctuary. do what? Uh, I'm gonna let it shine this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine let it shine let it shine everywhere I go I'm gonna let it shine Oh 
I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine. As our musicians are gonna pray to finger the place softly, is there one today? Is there one today? A Christian, I'm gonna give this invitation to first. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches if we are not careful and prayerful, prayerful and careful will take away our fire, take away the light that should be shining in our hearts. You've already given your life to Christ. You know him in the pardoning of your sins. But when you check the temperature of your heart, some wrong here. Some ain't quite right here. I can't be all the Lord wants me to be with my heart in this shape. 30% capacity, 50% capacity, 70% capacity, whatever it is, it's not functioning at full capacity. And I'm going to stop right here and right now. I'm going to acknowledge my heart is not in the right place. And I'm going to do something about it. And right where you are, I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but right where you are, you just ought to say to the Lord in your own way, he didn't call my name, Lord, but he sure was talking about me. I'm not as on fire as I used to be. The only worse thing, a person, only worse person than a person who has lost their fire it was a person who never had any fire at all. Don't know what I've been talking about for the last 15, 20 minutes. Never had no fire. Been in church all their life, but no fire. But today, that can change. I said, today, if I got to pray in church, you will bear witness. You may not be the one I'm talking to, but somebody is, and you praying right now. Your heart is on fire, and you want for your neighbor what you have for yourself. You're praying right now. If it's somebody on my pew that their heart is not, doesn't have the right temperature, Lord, fix it. Lord, move in their life. Lord, lift them. Lord, heal them. Don't let the devil have his way in that brother or sister's life. Oh, come on, somebody. Pray that prayer for another person. If your heart is right, Pray for somebody else because I know that somebody in the internet audience, your heart is not where it needs to be. You need to check your temperature of your heart and you need to get right and you need to do it right now. So Christian who's already given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, check your temperature. And if it's what it should be, shout praise the Lord. If it's not what it should be, Say, Lord, have mercy. 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 Don't be too proud to admit that you're not where you need to be. But if you cry out to him, he'll hear your humble cry. I said he'll hear your cry. Lord, hear my cry. Hear my cry. Hear my cry. I don't want you to catch me with my work undone. Hear my cry. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Can feel the rejuvenating power. Can feel the heart coming back to life. Can feel the fire starting to reburn and rekindle in my heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now to the, the person who has not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, this is your moment for you to give your life to Jesus. In such special way, that's why I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Oh, 
hallelujah, hallelujah. I love you, I love you, Lord, today because you cared for me in such a special way. That's why I'll praise you, I'll lift you up, I'll magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled. Oh, say it again. This is for the saints. This is our prayer to the Lord. We say what? I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you care for me in such a special way. That's why I'll praise you. I'll lift you up. I'll magnify your name. Are you sure today, man, woman, boy, or girl, who never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ? Get in the aisle right now. Come here and say, Preacher Patterson, I want to be able to sing that little song the saints are singing. But I can't sing it today because I've never given my heart to Jesus. What do I have to do? Well, I'll tell you. I'm glad you asked. You have to believe and you have to confess. That's it. And you will begin a journey that will culminate with your name having been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when you take your last breath on this earth, you'll be ushered into the presence of Almighty God. Hello, somebody. Don't you want that for yourself? Don't you want that for yourself? Eternity spent with God, praising His name, now, henceforth, and forevermore. No more tears, no more sorrows, no more sickness, no more lies, no more knives stuck in your back, no more problems of difficult people. But it starts with a decision. Lord, I want you to come into my life. I want to be able to sing the song these saints are singing that my heart is filled with praise. So come on, somebody. In the internet audience, there are instructions. I love you. Be seated. 